So welcome everybody. Uh, really excited to have Jackie Summers with us today. Welcome, Jackie. Welcome, Jackie. Uh, What's going on? How you doing? Fantastic. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to do my best to give you a, a great intro here. So um, I, I first met you uh, a couple years ago now at Wine on Wheels, which is an amazing event uh, led by a um, fantastic gentleman named Yannick Benjamin uh, that helps to benefit people who are um, disabled. And um, it uh, raises a lot of money for his organization. Uh, it has to do with wine. And, you know, me being a wine guy, I was there. And one of the, uh, one of the um, uh, events was uh, a session with you and a number of other wine professionals um, speaking about some diversity issues in the wine industry. And uh, honestly, it was one of the most impactful and inspiring uh, conversations that I've uh, been a part of um, in my time in this, in this industry, in my career. So um, it was really great to, to listen to you there. And we're really excited to have you on the show. Uh, Jackie is um, a, the founder of Sorel, uh, a really great brand uh, that we're going to talk about later. Uh, activist, author, uh, obviously a public speaker as well. And uh, Jackie, we're just super thrilled to have you on the show. Welcome. It is so good to be here. So good to see all of you. And so good to see fellow domes. Yes. <laughs> ah I'm only proud of being bald a couple times in my life. And this is one of them. I got to <laughs> screenshot this. <laughs> so, pleasure to have you here today. Absolute to, pleasure. Uh, yeah, I would love to, to have you um, kind of kick things off and and just tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, kind of your path in this industry that's led you to kind of where you are today doing what you're doing. So I will keep this as brief as possible because it's a longish story. About a decade ago, I had a cancer scare. My doctor found a tumor the size of a golf ball inside my spine. And he said, you have a 95% chance of death and a 50% chance of partial paralysis if you live. You should organize your affairs. Uh, short version of the story is I lived, but it will adjust your perspective permanently. Given the new outlook, I thought to myself, what do I really want to do with my life? And the thing I wanted to do more than anything else in the world is day drink. <laughs> I... N nothing noble about what I do. I want to be around cool people in the middle of the day, in the middle of the week, talking about stuff that matters, having good food and alcohol, and I wanted to monetize it. And I thought to myself, who's going to pay me <laughs> to drink <laughs> for a living? And I had this bright idea. My heritage is Caribbean, and every Caribbean family makes a version of this beverage called sorrel. They brew hibiscus flowers, add spices and rum. Everyone makes this. Everyone thinks they make the best version. I thought I made the best version. But nobody had ever bottled an alcoholic version and marketed it. So I thought to myself, I will be the first person to bottle and sell this beverage. How hard can it be? Turns out, it's, it's impossible to launch a liquor brand if you don't have a million dollars or come from a liquor family. I do not have a million dollars. I did not come from, from a liquor family. Actually, I, I knew nobody. I knew nobody in liquor a decade ago. And I, didn't have, I did not have a background as a food chemist. Uh, the joke I tell at this point is the beverage that became Sorel had sat in the Caribbean for four centuries and nobody had ever made a shelf stable version of it. So if you think you have an idea that's so good that no one's ever done it before, it's probably a terrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably a reason no one's ever done this before. Uh, so the first 500 attempts to make a shelf stable version of this were uh, disappointing. Around the 618th, 619th try, I finally got a version that cannot be broken. You can open it, close it, come back in five years. You can boil it, freeze it, leave it in the car. And it is st stable. I did it. Wow. Uh, right. 
Jackie, how long and did that take you? Took about six months of making a batch every single day and then bottling it and torturing it. Wow. And the first 500, six, the first 600 batches broke. Uh, but I have a particular affliction. I do not know what I cannot do. Now, uh, now broke, did you mean separate or did these bottles explode? Like what kind of, what, what were the extremes of what was going on with it? They were not bottles that would in any way be considered shelf stable. This is the thing that I tell new product people. You're making this thing that you have no idea what is going to happen to it once it leaves your factory. Yeah. Is it going to be in the back of a hot truck? Is it going to be in a freezer? Is it going to be in a warehouse in the, in the, in the light, in the dark? You have no idea what's going to happen to it. So you have to literally torture test your product before you put it on shelves. I, for the first 500, 600 batches, I would wake up in the morning, brew it, bottle it, and watch it break down in front of my eyes and start over the next day. Wow, that, uh, that uh, it broke that easily, huh? Again, there's a reason that no one had ever been able to do this before. Mm -hmm. the, the thing that I did differently that no one had done before Traditionally, this is made with rum in the Caribbean because everything has rum in the Caribbean. I was the first person to use a neutral grain spirit as the base. And what happens is, at a, when, you, when you add medicinal grade alcohol to the base mix, you actually create a, a molecular reaction where the base mix attaches a to the protein chains in the in the alcohol and forms polysaccharides. You form a pectin base. And once you remove the pectin base from the base mix, everything that's left is perfectly clear and you've and shelf stable, you've removed everything that might decay. Interesting. And, and I again I was the first person to actually do this. Uh, and what I didn't know about the entire process of launching a liquor brand was that was the easy part. <laughs> uh, the next part is so the next part was actually uh launching a micro distillery and financing it and getting a liquor license uh acquiring a liquor license is hard by design in order to launch a distillery it's a 10-year background check everywhere you've worked everywhere you've lived every dime you've made they want you to list the serial numbers of the equipment that you're going to use on your application. They yep. want you to hold a physical lease for the space on your application while you are waiting for your application, application to be approved, which can take a year to two years. And if there's a comma out of place on your federal, state, and state applications, they make you start all over again. Like the why people like Mike Laszlo here have a job. <laughs> it's why I no Seriously. longer want to be a lawyer. <laughs> it, you like you know it is it I is know. difficult by design. Uh, it's a regulated it, it, product. They make it hard. The barrier to entry is high. It, it's probably the second most regulated product in this country behind plutonium. Like it's really hard to get a, a license to make liquor. So I. I didn't have the money. I wrote the business plan. I raised the seed capital. I got this license, and I launched this brand called Sorel in 2012, and it just did gangbusters. The New York Times called it Christmas in a Bottle. Star Magazine put it on the celebrity page, called it Caribbean Sunshine in a Bottle. Uh, America's premier liquor authority, Paul Packold, gave it five stars. The guy hates everything. <laughs> Ultimate experience competition, it placed second in the, in the category with 95 out of, out of 100 points. Uh, Europe's primary uh, liquor authority, Simon Dickert, gave it five plus stars. It was, I mean, it just did. Both critically and public response was outrageously good. Wonderful. What I, di what I did not know and what I could not have known at the time is when I got my license to make liquor, 
I was the only black person in America at the time to hold that license. Really? There were a handful of, in 2012, there were a a handful of winemakers, a handful of brewmasters. On the liquor side, there were a handful of people who either had contract violence situations or import licenses. But an actual DSP holder, I was Tigger. Wow. I was the only one. Yeah, <laughs> I could never have guessed. So that meant that every single time I walked into a restaurant or a bar, every time I met with a sales team, every time I met with a distributor, every time I sat in a boardroom, there was no lived experience with somebody like me. It was interesting. And, and what was your what were you doing before then, Jackie? I mean, obviously you'd never done distilling or in the beverage world. So what was the background that you brought into this world that was there anything that you could apply as you started to come across these new challenges that you faced? I had five years in finance on Wall Street. I had ten years on Madison Avenue as a uh, advertising executive, and I had ten years in publishing as a magazine executive. So my last job before I transitioned over to booze, I was director of new media and production at a fashion magazine. So all of that stuff somehow was useful for this. Definitely. Obviously, the finance background was incredibly useful. The marketing background was incredibly useful. And being a production director in my, in my last corporate job, Taught me how to work a PL sheet and cut pennies from million dollar budgets. Yeah. So all of it was incredibly helpful in launching my own business. Yeah. Hey Jackie, did you start it by yourself? Were you the sole founder or did you have uh, you know going to funding? Did you have other people involved? That's a really good question. And this is something that I actually really tell people anytime they ask me about starting their own business. I started with partners. Uh, because, again, I didn't know anybody, and I didn't think I could do everything myself. I fired my partners before the first year was out. Wow. And one of the smartest things I ever did was insist on 51% of the ownership. So that way I had the controlling interest. Uh, again, I didn't know anyone, and I didn't think I, I could do everything myself, but I perfected the recipe. I wrote the business plan. It turned out that I was physically making the batches myself. I was doing the marketing, handling the social media, delivering product myself. Uh, After a while, it was like, if y'all aren't going to show up, what do you need? uh, Right. Yeah. Hey, Jackie, you you touched on something that I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in is the, that this is a 4,000 year old recipe that you decided to put into a bottle. In a, 400. A, oh, 400. I thought you said 4,000. Yes. Okay. I 400. thought that was pretty impressive, frankly. It was like 4,000. <laughs> 400. Um, how, did, how did the community react? How did the culture react to you bottling the culture's <laughs> drink? And I'm gonna assume that that's what, what it is. <laughs> they, ev, ev, again, as I mentioned, Every Caribbean family makes this and everyone thinks they have the best version. Yeah. So people would walk into stores when I'd be tasting and they'd look their nose up at me and they'd go, my grandmother made the best sarin. <laughs> and, and I would say, with, with all due respect to grandma, I don't make sorel, I make sorel. <laughs> try some. And they there would try go. it and they'd look their nose up and they'd go, not bad it's not bad. which is the best compliment you're ever going to get from a caribbean person and then they'd buy two or three bottles so that's great there you go the argument that i would have with caribbean people all the time and they walked in they would walk in and go i can make this at home and i would tell them you don't see french people walking into a wine store going i can make this at home exactly right you don't see mexican people walking into a liquor store going I can make mezcal at home. We do not see Japanese people walking into a liquor store going, I can make sake or or soju at home. Why would you not support your culture? 
And, and traditionally, um, in the uh, in the Caribbean culture, how is it enjoyed? Is it um, sipping? Uh, is it around a certain time of the year? How, how do they enjoy so, the spirit? Yeah. It's a traditional Christmas drink, but this is the great part of from a brand perspective. It, it caught on fire with the mixology community. The bartenders had so much fun with it, they used it in ways I didn't imagine. But consumers drank it the way it was consumed but traditionally by Caribbeans, and that's straight over rice. Mm -hmm. So while, while bars would use an ounce, ounce and a half in a cocktail, people would bring a bottle home and drink it like they would drink a bottle of wine. That helps with depletions. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, and here, here's the other part that I usually say off the record. So Sorel is hibiscus, ginger, cinnamon, nutmeg, clove. It's 15% alcohol, so about the strength of a fortified wine. But it does not have an alcohol buzz to it. Nutmeg is a mild narcotic. So people who drank Sorel didn't get a little drunk. They got a little high. Which is not a bad thing. Mike, I don't know if this is for you anymore, buddy. <laughs> Interesting. No, I, I might, you know, we'll have to see about that. <laughs> I'm going to go hit my nutmeg oh, cabinet tonight. Right in I've been looking for Sorel out here in Colorado the, for the last couple of weeks. I, I can't find any. It's going to be hard to find, and I'll tell you why. The first half year, 2012, I did 800 cases. The second year, I did 1,500 cases. The third year, I did 3,000 nine-liter cases. It got enough attention for the big boys to tap me on the shoulder. And a company approached me, and they said, listen, we think this is the next big thing. We build brands like yours and then help them prepare for acquisition. We just sold the brand to Picardy for a few hundred million dollars. Do you want to have a conversation? I said, sure, let's talk. Took us six months, but we arrived at a deal that made everybody happy. I signed papers to take my brand to national, and they reneged on the contract. Six after months after that, I'm in a bidding war with three of the biggest liquor companies on the planet, and one of them makes a very aggressive bid. And we agree on terms, and the lawyer looks me in the eye and says, I have papers for you in three days. Six months later, they go, you know, we're not comfortable, and they back out, and they renege on the contract. What were the reasons so, why, did they say? You would have a hard time. I would have a hard time telling you what their reasons were, but I will tell you that my mentor is a guy named Arthur Shapiro. He's the former chief marketing, marketing office, officer for Seagram's. And he still does some consulting for these companies. And he went to them and he said, what the hell happened? You wined him, you dined him, you made this aggressive bid. What went wrong? And they told Arthur, I was told we were not comfortable. That's the only explanation I got. What they said to Arthur was, we were afraid we weren't going to be able to control him. Interesting. Everyone, Everyone agreed the brand was a $100 million brand, 100,000 case brand within five, 10 years. They wanted the brand. They did not want me. Mm. How do, how, how'd that make you feel? I mean, you, you've built this brand. And I, I, my guess is from what I've read and from what I've seen, you are the brand. It's called Sorel, but it, it seems to me that you are the brand. Well, I had... I had two reactions to this. The first is there's nothing more American than taking the idea and labor of a person of color from them, making a lot of money with it and cutting them out of the deal. That's, that's America. Uh, but what actually happened is I had a nervous breakdown, ended up homeless. I have this very specific memory of December 7th, 2017 of waking up to the very distinct feeling of snowflakes melting on my face. 
which sounds idyllic until I realized that snowflakes were melting, melting on my face because I was sleeping outside in winter. I woke up in a pile of garbage and I thought to myself, this isn't tenable. I need to do something about this. So what happened? What happened next? I I got an apartment, but the entire time I was home, the time the entire time I was homeless, uh, I did the other thing that I do really well, which was I wrote. I wrote about food. I wrote about booze. I wrote about what it's like to be a marginalized person in the hospitality industry. I wrote an essay that won Best Food Essay in 2019 by the Association of American Food Journalists. But I wrote that while I was homeless on my phone. Wow. And I, What I happened to the, the brand during this time? What, what happened to the brand? Was it dormant? Was it still producing or? Um... The, brand, the, brand is, the brand went dormant. The demand is still high, but the brand at the moment is dormant while I put mm -hmm. the next deal in place. Mm -hmm. uh, the, in the interesting part, though, is, again, when I got into the liquor industry, I knew nobody and I knew nothing, but I was able to build my gravitas with my brand dormant far more than I did than when the brand was active. Interesting. So I built, I built more gravitas as a writer and speaker than I did as a brand owner. So your, your path towards speaking and writing uh, was via this, this incident, this, this, this time. So you kind of came into now where you are today and what you're doing. And, and as I know you as a speaker um, is, is kind of from the rising from this era. Well, here's the interesting thing. When I launched my brand in 2012, that was the year Trayvon Martin was killed. And I, as a new brand owner, I realized that a lot of the people that I was in business with uh, were, can I curse? Of course. <laughs> really fucking racist. And I had this sort of uh, opportunity as a new business person to make a choice between my principles and making money and my feeling was I can make more money. I can't make more integrity. But I did take it upon myself to start to write and to teach about uh, racism in the industry. And the interesting thing for, for, for me with that was when you start to teach racism, what you tell people is it's not enough not to be racist you must be actively anti-racist because the system is inherently racist. And I started to do the research and I had this thought, I'm telling people who don't think of themselves as racist to be anti-racist. I don't think of myself as sexist, but am I actually anti-sexist? Mm -hmm. And the answer was no. Uh, I might not personally, so I didn't think of myself as sexist, but I definitely wasn't personally doing anything to help deconstruct institutionalized sexism. Mm -hmm. And once you have that epiphany, there's this whole spectrum of privilege and oppression that opens up and you get to see, well, I have some oppression, but I definitely have some privilege too. I'm, I'm a cis, heterosexual, able-bodied male i've got tons of privilege and that means it's my responsibility as i move through the world to try to make life better for people who are differently disadvantaged than myself jackie when you say you 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 were working with folks that were i i don't want to put words in your mouth but you said fucking racist were they overtly racist to you it did it did it cause problems internally with the brand? I know you said you fired your, your, your founders, but where was it in the, in the beverage industry specifically? I'll give you a couple of examples. I, again, I would, I would walk into restaurants and bars with my product to, to, to tasting, and the most common response I got was deliveries were in the back. 
I'm I'm the brand owner. Okay, but like you what? No, like I own this brand. People didn't understand. I'll never forget being invited to my distributor in 2013 to present at the general sales meeting. 400 sales reps are called in and I am waiting in the lobby to give my presentation. I go in, I give a 20 minute talk, I get a standing ovation, I go, I don't think twice about it. Later that year, they have their, their annual portfolio tasting and they ask if I wanna come pour. Of course I wanna pour at their portfolio tasting. I get there and the receptionist recognizes me, runs up and gives me a big hug. And she tells me, you know, when you were here earlier in, when you were at office early this year, and you were sitting waiting in the lobby to give your talk, security called and asked if there was a problem. Again, I'm the brand owner. What do they think I'm going to do? The sad reality. So the, the level of racism, both on a macro and micro scale that I encountered every single day, it's hard to, it's hard to put into perspective. And Jackie, what about, every, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I, I was wondering how, what about with consumers? Uh, I don't know if you had much face-to-face -face with consumers, but was there, were there issues with the brand in consumers accepting you and the brand? Again, as it, as it was a very small company, I was doing, and again, with a small marketing budget, I was personally doing four or five tastings a week. I do two tastings on a, I do a tasting on a Friday night, two on a Saturday, two on a Sunday. And I can't tell you because I don't look like the person who's normally behind the desk doing the tastings. The number of times someone actually asked me if I was trying to poison them. Really? Jeez. Well, so, so your door, your brand's dormant now and you found success in other areas. How do you, or I guess I should ask, do you plan to, uh, to revive the brand or you, is the distillery still there? I, I mean, I have so many questions about it, but. Well, the, the plan was to revive the brand this year and I'm glad I didn't because COVID, COVID right. fucked every, COVID equally fucked everything up. Uh, yeah. There was still plan to bring the brand back for next year. I'm in those conversations right now. And there are plans to bring other brands to market, which have a similar profile to Sorel in that they are beverages that have a unique cultural background that have been around for centuries that nobody has seen fit to bottle. Yeah. I will never make a gin, a rum, a whiskey, a vodka, a tequila, there are enough of those products and there are enough people that are doing them well. Truthfully, I think that craft products have a hard time doing those things well. There's glut because of that. But if I have an opportunity to introduce category defining products, I will do that. And I have several of those lined up and ready to go. Amazing. Great. Jackie, um, at, you know, last week I was actually reading um, a piece that you had written um, and it was called, uh, you showed up for sexism, now show up for racism. And I read that. And then at the end, I scrolled back up and I realized you wrote that in 2017. And I felt like I was reading something that you just recently wrote. And it was so profound, but also so sad that our, that our world hadn't evolved from where that was then. And in it, you talked about allyship. And I think um, and being an ally. And you talked earlier about privilege. And if you look around the, the beverage industry, it's white dominated. And there is privilege that exists. There's white privilege that, that we all have on, on this call. How, how do you, how could, could you offer some insight to people that have that white privilege or that platform on how they can be allies? So just to be clear, it, it has been interesting to have been having essentially the same conversation for the last decade. And in the last two months, people suddenly realize racism is a real thing. Mm -hmm. It feels like I have been telling people UFOs are real 
and then they've seen their first UFO themselves for the first time. It's like, oh, look at that. He wasn't, he's not crazy. Yes, I wasn't crazy the whole time, and it's always been real. Uh, but yay, everyone has finally got to the point where we're in agreement that it's a real thing. Um, the conversation about what to do about it is interesting because I personally spent years telling people that the best thing that could happen, the thing that's in everyone's best interests, is to build a longer table. It has been definitively proven that the more diverse your management team is, uh, the more profitable you will be. So you can technically be a racist, sexist asshole who likes money and diversify your board for no other reason than you like money. And, you, and, and good things will happen because of that. COVID overthrew all the tables. And our industry is in a place that I don't think it's been in in any of our lifetimes. And the interesting part for me is I'm trying to see why I should help reset a table where I was never welcome. So what I'm trying to tell people now is there's never been a better time to build your own table. So I am all for finding ways to look within your organizations for existing talent and mentoring them and guiding them. I am all for, again, looking inside your existing organizations and promoting people and, and letting them manage and letting them uh, have a, an equity share. But more than that, I am all for finding people who have their own ideas, who have the volition, who have the drive, who have the ingenuity and going, could you use a hammer? Right. Could I lend you some wood? Do you know how to build a table? And helping people to do their own, helping people to build their own tables and building tables from the ground up where everybody is welcome. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a unique time and I don't think we could squander it when we really could help people of, of all kinds of marginalization to create their own tables again where everybody is welcome and everybody benefits. So I mm -hmm. think at the moment, the best way we can figure out how to be the best allies to modulations, modulations, whether it's people of color, disabled people, women, the queer community, let's find those folks who have their own ideas and give them the tools that they need, whether that's learning how to do a PL sheet, whether that's introducing them to the right investor, whether that is actually sitting down with them and helping them to write their business plans. Mm -hmm. There are things that we can all do that can contribute to people starting off on their own and creating equality. Mm -hmm. This kind of leads into one of my questions for you, which um, I just read your piece also that you did for James Beard um, on access to capital. Um, and, you know, I, I love that piece that kind of that kind of falls into the same camp of um, of being able to give giving people the access to be able to create their own table to create their own business and, and be successful on their own um, you know what what advice I guess could you give to people who are looking to raise capital um, who maybe aren't experienced doing it uh, kind of the, the you know the best steps I guess to go out and try to do that for themselves <sighs> So when I wrote my business plan, the first thing I did was go to all of my friends who had MBAs and say, how do you write a business plan? And all of them went, because uh -huh. <laughs> they'd done it for school and they'd never done it in real life. So again, because I don't know what I can do, I taught myself how to write the plan. I taught myself how to write a prospectus. 
I, I cannot stress enough the need to, to the extent that it is possible, prepare yourself. i tell you a fun story. Uh, six months after I left corporate America forever, I got a call from a buddy of mine who works for Hearst Magazines. He said, don't tell anyone we're buying another media company. There's going to be overlap. There's going to be layoffs. But I want my people running my magazines. Come back, he said. Come work for me. Six-figure salary, 34th floor, corner office overlooking Central Park. I know in my heart I'm not going back. I'm not. But I take the meeting because there's a friend of mine. We're having burgers on the Upper West Side. I reach into my bag. I pull out a bottle that I'd made in my kitchen. Again, because I don't have a license. I don't have a physical space. At this point, I don't have the business plan. But I know what I'm going to do, and I'm explaining it, what I'm going to do to him. And the guy at the next table next to us is listening. He stands up and he goes, so are you looking for investors? So I stand up. I shake his hand, I give him my business card, I reach into my, into my bag, and I grab a second bottle because I know to be prepared. <laughs> and I hand it to the guy, and I say, take this home, enjoy it with your family. If you're still interested in investing, we'll talk later in the week. I didn't even look at his card, to be honest. I just shoved it in my wallet. The next day, I'm rifling through my wallet, and I'm looking at this card trying to figure out who, who it was I spoke to. And I'm trying to figure out why the name Alexander Bernstein sounds so familiar. It's because it's Leonard Bernstein's son who runs the Bernstein Foundation. He was the first person to sign a check. But wow. it's only because I was prepared. Yep. So well, and he, he, he heard you be talking passionately about your project, not to him. Yeah. yeah. So to the, to the extent that you can, you have to be prepared because when opportunity is there, you, you got to be able to take advantage of it. That's to, your, to, to the extent that you can, you've got to do what you, you can do. The, the place where allies come in, so much good could have been done if I knew anyone who could have opened up the Rolodex to me and go, here's a guy you should talk to. Here's someone you should meet with. Here's someone you should have a coffee drink with. Here's someone who to treat you the product with. The, the hardest part about access is it's not always access to money. It's access to people. It's access to, to human resources. It's access to people who have knowledge that you don't. Mm -hmm. Just access to other humans is the, it's the um, absolute game changer. I didn't know anybody. Now I can actually walk into pretty much any bar in the country and it's all, Jack, sit down, have a drink. What do you want? Mm -hmm. So now I can actually help other people to, to, in a place where no one could help me when I started. Mm -hmm. When we talk about allyship too, I think it's interesting because there's different ways of being an ally, right? You can be uh, a disruptor, you could be an advocate, et cetera. Um, you know, for me, that was always one of the, the really inspiring takeaways from your, your lecture a few years ago. Um, can you kind of recap that for us? Because I think it's just really sure. for a lot of people. So the I think basic theory. Really difficult. Like, I think, you know, people may consider themselves to be allies, but don't always know exactly the right or way to, to attack something or uh, maybe, you know, understand where they are positioned in such a way to be able to help. And, um, you know, it was really clear to me that it doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, that you do have a position uh, to, to, to be an ally. So, um, tell us about that. So the basic theory is during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, you could actually divide people into four different categories, helpers, advocates, rebels, and helpers, rebels, advocates. I always think about the fourth one is helpers, 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 okay. rebels, advocates, organizers. Yes. Helpers, rebels, advocates, organizers. So depending on where anyone is in their particular point in life, you can fit into one or more of those categories. Helpers, 
might not have the power to make actual change, but they can actually reach out on a one-on-one basis and go, how are you doing? What can I do? So something I can actually help that would actually get me through this. Uh, rebels, rebels are the fire and the loud mouths and the noise. They will get the passion and the movement and the fire behind the movement. They might not know what to do next, but they will actually really be great spokespeople and get everyone involved. Right. They yes. bring the attention to it. Organizers might not be the mouthpieces and they might not be good one-on-one, but they know how to bring all of the different pieces together and get everyone who needs to be working, working on what they need to do. And advocates are folks who are already inside the system who can affect change. So no matter who you are and where you are at a particular point in life, you can be a helper, an advocate, a rebel, or an organizer. And the great part about that is you're not consigned to a single role. Roles can change depending on how your situation changes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, obviously with everything that's going on right now, and these last few men- months have been very turbulent, and I think, you know, in some ways, uh, you know, difficult, but also I think provides a really interesting and good opportunity for you know, for things to change in a meaningful way. How are you looking at this uh, right now from, from your point of view? Um, you know, what are you feeling right now and what are you hoping to, to see uh, evolve in, these next, in this next chunk of, chunk of time? I think that COVID exposed frailties in our industry that no one was prepared to acknowledge. I think that the margins people were working on were never tenable. And I think that we need a completely different approach moving forward if we want to have a, a hospitality industry that's functional for everyone. It wasn't, it wasn't working before. You sh- it, we, we shouldn't have an industry that cannot survive if you go three weeks without your current level of income. It's, it's not tenable. Mm-hmm. And there are so many great, great businesses that aren't going to get through this the way that things are happening now. And that is, it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. We are going to need to reevaluate uh, how we deal with land ownership. Because at the end of the day, Commodities prices are static. Labor prices have been static for 30 years, but rents keep going up. All of the restaurants that I know that have gone out of business in the last few years, they woke up one morning and their rent was tripled. Did the value of the land somehow triple? We're going to have to convince those who have to be okay with having enough and so the rest of us can have some too. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, for me, that's the biggest thing is figuring out how to get, how to, how to equalize the value of, of, of physical spaces. Because without the physical spaces, we don't have restaurants and bars anymore. We don't. Uh, I do not, I do not know how we can have a hospitality industry without face-to-face human interaction. The value of a sommelier one-on-one giving you advice on your meal or a bartender interacting while you're having your drinks, that's immeasurable. Mm -hmm. And I know that we got back to this before 100 years ago, I don't know how we're going to get back to it now, but we have to. We have to figure out how we can get everyone back to a place of feeling safe, eating and breathing in the presence of other human beings again. It might be a few years before we get there. It seems we inevitable that it would be a few years. And, 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 and everything that happens before then is an interim solution. We have to. Do we have to be okay with interim solutions because the long haul says it until we've got 60, 70% of the people inoculated or, or 
from this, we can't meet in public like we used to. We can't. Mm -hmm. At the moment, that's a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. Well, I think even just us talking right now on Zoom, that's a Band-Aid. And I think we've all been Absolutely. doing it long enough. And people, I think we're also realizing it was a novelty at first, but now we're like, wow, this is no replacement to that human interaction. No. Right. Um, no. And whether that's buying a meal kit and having cooking at home, that's not a replacement for that human interaction. And I'm, you know, they say COVID has um, has um, expedited and uh, fast forwarded so much um, uh, evolution of technology. But how do we also make sure that that is that lack of the human interaction is not standing in the way of some of the challenges that you were facing talking about earlier about being at the table because right. what other barriers could come of this, but it's really important to now have awareness of some of those and make sure that as we're rebuilding this, that we're not building it with even, you know, a, a taller table that's even harder to sit at or a shorter table with it. And um, it's a really unique opportunity that we're, we're faced with and it's what we do with it, I think is gonna be really important. Well, think about those could... without access to technology. Mm -hmm. We take the iPhone and an internet con connection pretty, pretty much for granted at this point. Mm -hmm. And not every school has the ability to have everybody participate with online. 100%. My daughter's school, you know, she has an iPhone. She can t go online when needed. But, but we were told not everybody in the class has that ability. And it's, you take it for granted. And, yep. and so exactly. the, the schools with less funding, you know, I feel for, for the children who, um, who maybe can't, don't, you know, aren't going to be going back to school this fall, uh, whether that's because of their parents or because the school's not going to reopen. Um, do they have the capabilities to continue to learn at home? Some, some kids will, and there's a lot of kids that won't. And, that, you know, unfortunately, you know, it, it tends to uh, um, adversely affect those uh, that, that need it the most and, you know, come from poorer communities and, and frankly, people of color. So it's a, it's a terrible situation. But Jackie, the other point I was thinking, as we we're just talking about the school, what about the missed opportunity for not having um, an investor overhear a conversation you had in public and hand you his business card and shake his hand and hand him a bottle of your beloved product that he ultimately right. cherished and bought into the company? That, that right. doesn't exist in Zoom. It can't exist in nope. this world. Nope. That whole interaction. I mean, that's we're missing that every single second of every single day. Mm -hmm. And right now, you know, we're talking about access. All of the purse strings got tightened this year. All of them. Yeah. So if you don't have access to somebody who's actually looking to invest, there's no chance, mm -hmm. no chance of launching a new business. No, I'm finding I'm getting more calls right now for for uh, ready to drink cocktails and then you know business um, you know beverage labels not like yours yours is very unique i don't get you know not many people are are come with that it's much more bourbon based and you know vodka based still but what i'm seeing is people are trying to do as much as they can with with little to no investment and playing it over the next 2 to 3 years if they can and i'm Right. I don't know how that's going to work, but I'm actually I'm very surprised. I've told Dustin a few times how many calls I get lately. I don't know how many are going to work, but people are trying, and I, with very limited access to capital, but it it is it's impressive in the liquor world to still see that drive to to get to market. Well, I I'll say a couple of things. We we're going to define limited access as anything under a million dollars. If funny. you don't have a million dollars to start with, this isn't serious period. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that happens is, as you said, most people are trying to get into, get into a whiskey or bourbon, but that shit takes time. Three years. And if, if you don't have the, the years to sit on a product, you can't do this. So what happens most of the time is people will do what can be put out immediately, mm -hmm. which is a, a gin or a, a vodka. And yep. then you've got glut. And then you've got, why should we actually sell your product mm -hmm. there's no shelf couple, space yeah you know, and that's the other ago, problem I, a couple of years ago i gave a talk at adi called nobody wants to drink your shit <laughs> and i told a room full of distillers congratulations you did it you got your license you launched your distillery 
You got your a juice in a bottle. You brought it to market. Nobody cares. It's true. Nobody cares. It happens all the time you in the no wine more- world too. I, I see it all the time. People that make make wine and they're like, "Look at this thing I made." It's like, "Cool, hey, tastes yeah, good." Nobody good cares. <laughs> <laughs> you are not in the liquor business. You're in the relationship business. Yep. Yeah. And if you can't create and maintain your relationships, nobody wants to drink your shit. Yep. Jack, Jackie, um, you were black distiller number one in the United States of America uh, with the distiller's license. Since you've paved the way, are there others that you have mentored along the way or that you, um, so your peers that you uh, look up to with what they've been able to accomplish and create? So I was the first person to get, I was the first person in the modern era to get a, to get a license to make liquor in 2012. Chris Montana followed me in 2013. So I think there are five across the country right now, black people who have this DSP license. Yay, progress. We've the got D- 2,000, we've got 2,000 new distilleries and five new DSP holders of color. But, and that is uh, for people listening who don't understand the DSP is a very difficult license to get for every for everything Jackie said earlier. Um, but more than that, you don't get to test your recipes. I know Jackie never would have done this illegally. You don't get to test your uh, you can't rectify and you can't well, you certainly cannot distill without that license. So you can home brew yep. and you can home make you know be a home winemaker. You cannot be a home distiller. So you have to nope. put all the investment in first then yep. test it and that is horrific but that's but bootlegging the person, so <laughs> the, the, the person to watch though was fawn weaver so it was proven that the individual who taught jack daniels how to make whiskey was a slave uncle nearest which is owned and run by fawn weaver is a company that builds on that legacy and it is the most aggressive growing whiskey brand on the planet. Uh, so Fawn is breaking down all sorts of barriers. Say the name of that brand again. Sorts. Uncle Nearest Whiskey. Uncle Nearest Whiskey. Yes. Uh, and again, it's, it's, it's just growing so fast. And it is, it is being made by the descendant of the person who taught Jack Daniels how to make whiskey. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. But, but again, this is something that I've tried to say from the beginning is it's not that we didn't have the ability or the volition. Uh, we, we were there from the beginning. We weren't able to participate in it and capitalize on it. Uh, if you read the articles that Dave Wondrich has written, you can trace cocktail culture in this country to black people. You can trace... You can trace dive bar culture in this country back to black people but there are very few black bartender bar owners or dive bar owners we've contributed so much and we own so little and we're ready for that to change Mm -hmm. coming out of covid and in the the world we're in how how do you see that changing how is that you know it's one thing to talk about it and to you know to uh to, to work on it, but you do need access to capital. You do need training. I, I mean, look, I, I know a lot about distilling just from being a lawyer for distilleries. I couldn't possibly go home tonight and learn and actually distill something. How do you teach the craft and, and actually teach how to make a product that even if you have this great story that somebody actually wants to put in their mouth and drink? How do you do that? Well, you can be insane like I am and teach your goddamn <laughs> self. <laughs> um, or, or, Fawn Weaver is now working with Jack Daniels to create a school that is licensed to teach distilling uh, on a collegiate level. So people will be able to walk in and get an education and walk out with a degree in distilling. This is through Jack Daniels. Yes. I want to say that that's that's just the beginning. Knowing how to distill does not teach you how to make a product. Does not teach you how to how to run a company. Does not teach you how to make a brand. Yeah. So there are all sorts of different things that are involved. They're completely different skill sets, but that is a good place to start. Mm-hmm. Uh, I tell people if you want to start your own company, 
solve a problem for someone. Yes. If you're not solving a problem for somebody, you're creating a problem for somebody. This, this is why if someone tells me, oh, they want to come up with a new gin, who's that, who's, who's that solving a problem for? Mm -hmm. it, it's, 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 your, it's, it's your local bar trying to figure out why they should you, you use your gin instead of the 15 others that they have and your local retailer figure out, trying to figure out why they should put yours on the shelf instead of you know all of the giant companies that are paying them to shelve their exactly. products. Yep. If you're not solve a problem, solve a problem for someone else, and you and actually really create a problem, you, you create an answer for yourself. The other thing I tell people is make it profitable for other people, and you'll make it profitable for yourself. One of the big problems that I that I've always seen with craft branding is they price things in a way that they will make money, and not that re restaurants or bars or retailers will make money. Or even the distributors sometimes too. The distributor, everybody needs to be incentivized to sell your product. Yes, absolutely. Yes, if 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 your product isn't priced where everyone else makes money, why would they care? 100%. Nobody wants to drink your shit. So there's <laughs> there are a lot of different skill sets that need to be picked up, and I think we're getting to a place where we can actually see mentorship starting to happen. But I think the biggest thing is again. Access to people who are doing it or have done it is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. now, when you uh, when you relaunch Sorella or when you bring it out of hibernation, are you, how are you going to be a, a member of the commu that community to, to or assuming you are going to be? Um, how how are you going to involve people and, and teach them how to do what you've done? So the two big things that are going to happen for me next year are my first book is coming out. I'm super right. excited about that. And I'm going to step back as uh, from day to day operations of Thrill and put my vice president in charge of everything. I'm going to stay on as founder, promote her to president. She will do a better job than I ever did. She's as smart as I am and 10 times as good looking. <laughs> what, is your, uh, what is your book about, Jackie? Oh, I wrote a fairy tale for adults. Uh, a modern fairy tale about how to cope with social justice fatigue. Uh, so the, the book is called The Garden of Infinite Fucks. <laughs> <laughs> and the whole, the whole point of the book is you, you can't not give a fuck, but you can allocate. Allocate your fucks. <laughs> Allocate. Alloc put your fucks in allocation. Like, if you give a fuck about everything, you're going to run out. But if, you, if, if you're not allocating your with fucking Two really good one-liners here. Oh, no, I, I love it. I just hope, that, I hope there's a t-shirt series that comes from this. And Is allocate your fucks. <laughs> Listen, there, there's, a, there's a line in the book. I shouldn't, I shouldn't give this away. And you know, I'm not going to give it away because then it's not going to be in a t-shirt when the book comes out. But... <laughs> Read my goal is going my goal is going to be to relaunch the products and to put my VP in charge and let her run L day to day stuff. She's gonna do a better job than I ever did and stay on as founder and take uh, a larger role in, in the in the public eye as a writer. Beautiful. And then hopefully I can use public awareness through books as leverage to move alcohol. Mm -hmm. And unlike unlike some celebrities who attach themselves to liquor brands without any actual uh, legitimacy, I will have actual legitimacy, legitimacy in my industry. And while the public will see me as a writer who sells alcohol, I like to be a guy who made alcohol who sells books. There you go. That's the that's the goal. So what is what is the, do you have the timing around when the uh... When Sorel will relaunch? I do not have the timing yet, but we're looking for a spring relaunch. I am in conversations with investors right now. You know how this, this business goes. Alcohol is like fashion. You need to think six months out. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if we, if everything is ready by October, that means we'll be on the market in March. If Great. all things go well. 
Uh, and that is trying to plan again for the reality of COVID because we have no idea when on-premise will be a real thing again, uh, which is going to take away 30% of whatever you thought your sales were going to be. Mm -hmm. That's got to be factored into everything. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I'll be looking forward to that and uh, definitely keep us in the loop at Verve because I I'd love to support and carry the product and introduce it to people. It'd be a lot of fun. Thank you so much. I can't wait to try it. Yeah. I can't wait to try I'll, it. I'll send you a bottle. I would, well, right. we'll figure out a way how to do that legally because you know, we would never <laughs> engage in illegal well, trafficking. I, I, you send I, it I to can, me, I, Jackie, and I'll tell my Send it to Dustin. <laughs> send it to Dustin and I'll get it from Dustin. That's right. I can, I can send you a sample. <laughs> okay. <Got it. laughs> I love, I, I've been addicted to hibiscus tea for the past three months and I'm just, so this was very topical. And I just wait till you wait get some uh, grain spirit and some nutmeg in there. I need the nutmeg. And I need to get home yeah. and get some nutmeg. Next <laughs> level. You know, some yeah. 3 a.m. text messages. You know, high on the nutmeg, Dustin. High on, high on <laughs> <laughs> um, before, oh. we, before we have to let you go, I, you know, I think you've covered a couple of these things, but for young business owners, and I don't mean age-wise, but you know, newer newbies to business coming you know, coming from any particular walk of life, what is your, your piece of advice to them? Uh, you know, what, what would keep, what kept you going in times of despair? What is your advice to, to folks uh, just starting a business now? Go crazy. Okay. You, you like, you, you need sane people to run a successful business. You need crazy people to start them. I started my business. I'm 52. I started my business 10 years ago at 42. Most people don't leave 20, a 25-year corporate career behind and think, oh, I'm going to go do something I've never done before. In the past 10 years, everything I've done is something I've never done before. The writing is new to me. The public speaking is new to me. The liquor industry is new to me. Go crazy. This is very simple. Again, I had a cancer scare, and I had this very specific vision that I wanted to make sure that if my last day on earth was today or 40 years from now, that I knew what I would be doing. Talking with cool ass people about stuff that matters and having a drink. And God damn it, I'm doing that today. So if I die today, today was a good day. Go crazy. Love that. Love it. Love you, it, 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 you're, you're not doing yourself any favors thinking to yourself, I will take the safe path. You can take you can take safe just take the safe path forever and fulfill someone else's dream so you can do it your goddamn self. Mm -hmm. Go going crazy is easy. Staying crazy takes commitment. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Okay. Well, Jackie, it was so amazing to uh, hear your story and um, for you to to share some great insight that you've had along the way. And for those um, listening, make sure you check out JackieSummers.nyc. There's the book coming out. Um, and personally, I can't wait to drink your shit. Um, and <laughs> we, not just... We, uh, Justin and I will figure it out. Yeah, can't I wait. love it. And I, and I just want... Just, I, I, want yeah. sorry, I can't no. guarantee that I'll get it to these guys. It might... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> But if nothing else, I want to day drink with you when this is all behind us, because uh, I think that would be a great productive afternoon. I will see you on the other side of this. Hell yes. Awesome. I was just going to say, I cannot wait to, to do this again. And I hope you agree to do it again when we're all in person sitting at the table with your with uh, Sorrel. I cannot wait. From, yeah. from your lips to God's ears. Hell yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, be safe there, Jackie. And uh, thank you for your time. Jackie, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Everyone stay safe. Take care. It's really a pleasure. Good, man. Thanks.